In this video, we're gonna look at a pretty interesting question, and that is, when does the so-called freshman's dream for the derivative of a product of functions actually work? So in other words, when is it true that we take f of x times g of x and then take the derivative? Do we get the same thing as taking the derivative of f and the derivative of g and then multiplying them? So we know that the product rule says that this is in general not true, but maybe it is true for some choices of f and g. So let's explore to see if that is the case. And so what I want to do is maybe let's just start with this left hand side. So we have f of x g of x. Now we're going to take the derivative of that. So I'll denote this by f of x times g of x and then the whole thing prime. So we know that by the product rule that should be equal to f prime of x g of x plus f of x g prime of x. So in other words, what we have here is that this thing up here which I've boxed in yellow is true if and only if this thing that I'm going to underline here is the same as this thing that I underline up here. In other words, f prime times g plus f times g prime needs to be equal to f prime times g prime. And so now we've got a, like a differential equation that we can maybe play around with tweak something involving f and g until maybe we have a solution. Okay, so let's see what that would involve. So from here down, I'm going to suppress the dependence on x, but let's just recall that all of these depend on x. And so what we really have here is f prime times g plus f times g prime equals f prime g prime. So we're trying to find functions f and g that satisfy this equation. So now we have to pick one of these to focus on. And by one of these, I mean one of these functions. Do we want to solve for the function f or solve for the function g? Because since we have a single differential equation, we can't leverage a single differential equation to solve for two unknown functions. So we're gonna do that in the following way. So let's go ahead and suppose that g of x is fixed, but it's arbitrarily fixed. And then we're going to view this as a differential equation for the function f, and that depends on the function g, but we fixed the function g. So let's see if we can get any leverage out of that. So what I want to do is maybe move all of the f primes to one side and move everything without an f prime to the other side. So that's going to give me f prime times g minus f prime times g prime equals negative f times g prime. So I've just moved this over to the left and I've moved this over to the right. All right, great. Now notice I can factor an f prime out of the left hand side. That's going to give me f prime times g minus g prime equals negative f g prime. That's good. Now I can move everything having to do with g to the right hand side, everything having to do with f to the left hand side, and that's going to give me this following uh, equation. So I'll have f prime of x over f of x. So I'll put my dependence on x back in because we're getting kind of towards the end of solving this differential equation, and that's gonna be equal to g prime of x divided by g prime of x minus g of x. And let's so see how we did that. We divided this guy over to the right-hand side, but we had this minus sign switch the order of this subtraction. But now we're good to go because we wanna think about this as containing all of our x's, and this guy over here contains all the information about the function that we're trying to solve for. So we can take the antiderivative of both sides of this with respect to x. So I'll go ahead and take the antiderivative of this with respect to x, the antiderivative of this with respect to x. But now looking at the left-hand side, we have a fairly simple antiderivative. Notice we can use a u substitution. We can let u equal f of x, but that's gonna make du equal f prime of x dx. And so we have our du is gobbled up by, um, and so this f prime times dx is gobbled up by du, and here we just have u. And then we know that the antiderivative of one over u is the natural log of u, so that turns this left-hand side into the natural log of f of x. Okay, and then let's see what we get on the right-hand side. So since we do not know anything about g of x, we can't 
form a closed antiderivative for this, so we just have to copy this down. So here we have the antiderivative of g prime of x over g prime of x minus g of x. And I'm gonna go ahead and put a constant of integration out to the end of that. Now the next thing that I can do is exponentiate both sides. So notice that's gonna give me f of x equals, and instead of writing e to the power of the right-hand side, I'm gonna write exp, just because we're putting a lot of stuff inside of that exponent. So I've got exp, and then the antiderivative of g prime of x over g prime of x minus g of x, uh, dx plus a constant. And then finally, the next thing that we want to do is use the fact that e to the u plus c is equal to e to the u times e to the c. And then what we'll do is take this c and rewrite it as a capital C constant. So in other words, we're taking this constant which has been added inside the exponent and turn it into a constant that's been multiplied outside of the exponent. So that will give us kind of our final solution here, and that is f of x equals c, and then the exponential of the antiderivative of g prime of x over g prime of x minus g of x dx. And so that means given a function g, I can find a function f that is of this form where our freshman's dream for the product rule works. In other words, the derivative of f times g is the same thing as the derivative of f times the derivative of g. Okay, so from here what I wanna do is pick up at this point and then work out a few examples of pairs of functions that make this rule satisfied. So far what we've done is the following. We've said that if we want this equation to be satisfied, that the derivative of f times g equals the derivative of f times the derivative of g, then f has to be have the following form. And we could have done this similarly for g, but we just did it in terms of f. So f needs to be c times the exponential of this antiderivative. So it's the antiderivative of g prime over g prime minus g dx. And now I've put this big asterisk down here, and this is assuming everything is nice. And this really gets into the purpose of this video. And the purpose of this video, video is exploratory. And in fact, whenever you're trying to play around with new mathematical ideas, not that this is really a brand new mathematical idea, but whenever you try to play around with these newer mathematical ideas, you really just wanna play around without rules first, come up with some nice examples, and then at the end of doing all of that, once you've built some intuition, dig into what exactly the hypotheses need to be in order for such a thing to exist. So we're not gonna do that here. I'm not sure that fun videos like this are the place for digging into things like that, so we're just gonna start from this point and then work out a few examples. So I wanna work out three examples, um, building off of this setup that we have derived. And the first example is, let's say that g of x is x to the r power. So this is a nice class of examples. And so let's see what we get in this case. So that means that g prime of x is equal to r times x to the r minus one. And that means that f of x is equal to c times the exponential of the antiderivative of g prime of x. So notice that's gonna be r times x to the r minus one over g prime of x. So that's r times r to the x minus one minus x to the r dx. Great. So now we just have to figure out how to simplify that antiderivative on the inside. So here's what I wanna do. I'll take the numerator and the denominator and multiply them both by one over x to the r minus one and see what that gives us. So that's gonna give us a constant times the exponential of the antiderivative. So now in the numerator, we just have r. And then in the denominator, we're going to have r minus x, because here we have x to the r over x to the r minus one, so that's clearly just x. Now we have dx. Great. But now, by a simple u substitution, it's pretty easy to see what this is. This is gonna be c times the exponential of, the antiderivative of this will be r, and then the natural log of r minus x, 
but this isn't quite right because if we take the derivative of this, we do get this function up here, but the chain rule tells us that we get a minus sign, so that means I need to put a minus sign right here. And you might say, well, where was our constant of integration? Well, we took care of that in the general case, and that became a multiplicative constant right here. Okay, great. So now the next thing that I wanna do is use some logarithm rules, and that means I can take this minus r here and bring it into the exponent here. Great. But now my exponential and my logarithm will cancel, and that'll just give me c times um, r minus x to the minus r. In other words, it is c over r minus x to the r. So that's what we get for our function f. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and clean this up and then we'll look at another example. Okay, for our next example, I wanna look at an exponential function. So let's take g of x to be equal to e to the ax. Notice that means that g prime of x equals a times e to the ax by the chain rule. Okay, and then by the formula that we developed, we have f of x equals c, and then the exponential of the antiderivative of g prime, so that's gonna be a e to the ax over g prime, so that's another a e to the ax minus g, but that is e to the ax dx. Now we can do something similar to what we did in the last example, and we'll take the numerator and the denominator, and here we'll multiply by e to the minus ax. Great. But there's a lot of self-similarity there, so a bunch of stuff cancels, and we're left with c, and then that exponential of the antiderivative, we're left with an a in the numerator, and an a minus one in the denominator, dx. Great. But then the antiderivative of this thing, which is just a constant, that's important to notice, will just be that constant times x. Then we take the exponential of that and we clearly get the following solution. So we have c e to the a over a minus one times x. So that will be our function f of x um, given the function g of x, that exponential function up there. Okay, so I wanna clean up the board and we'll look at one more example. For our last example, I wanna look at g of x equals the cosine of x. Okay, so we looked at a power of x, we looked at an exponential function, now we're gonna look at a trigonometric function. And I'll say that you can pick a couple of very simple polynomials and you'll get nice solutions as well. But in terms of picking a semi-random function, you will probably get something um, over here that is not integrable. So these are actually picked kind of carefully. Okay, so let's see what we get here. So now we're gonna have g prime of x equals negative sine x. So obviously the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And so that's gonna give us f of x is our constant times this exponential of the antiderivative of g prime, so that's minus sine of x, over g prime, so that's minus sine of x, and then minus g of x, so that's gonna be minus cos x dx. Great. So the great thing here is we've got all sorts of minus signs, and so that means we can cancel all of them. So in some ways, we're just factoring a minus sign out of the numerator and the denominator and then canceling them. Now that may look like a fairly difficult integral, but there's a trick to make it not so hard. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that antiderivative, bring it out of the exponential so we can play around with it a little bit. So I have the antiderivative of sine of x over sine of x plus cosine of x dx. So now let's look at this integral and let's kind of be inspired by u substitution to make our first step. So if we were to let u equal the denominator, maybe that would have a simplifying effect. So if u equals sine of x plus cosine of x, then that's gonna make du equal to cosine of x minus sine of x dx. Because the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. Okay, so that means that it would be nice if something like this were in the numerator. So let's just kind of note that, so nice, in the numerator. 
So it would first be nice if we had something like cosine of x minus sine of x in the numerator because then we could do just a straight up u substitution and we'd be good to go. Another thing that would be nice to have in the numerator is, equal, is cosine of x plus sine of x. So why is that nice to have in the numerator? Because if that's in the numerator, it just straight up cancels the denominator down into one, and we know how to integrate the number one. So that gives us some motivation. Maybe we can take our actual numerator and rewrite it in terms of a combination of these two things, which would be nice to have in the numerator. And in fact, we can. Notice if we take this guy right here, and subtract this guy right here, we end up with two times sine. So that means if you take half of that, then you're good to go. So in other words, we're going to have one half and then we'll have the integral of cosine of x plus sine of x over that. So cosine of x plus sine of x dx and then plus the integral of cosine of x, sorry, minus the integral of cosine of x minus sine of x over cosine of x plus sine of x dx. Great. So let's check that that makes sense. So notice I have a common denominator here. So that means I could put those integrals together into one piece fairly easily. I have cosine minus cosine, so those are gonna cancel. I have sine minus negative sine, and so those are gonna combine together into two sine, but I've got this half out here which turns that into one sine. And so we're good to go. But the next thing we wanna notice is that this thing simplifies down just to the number one. Then using this u substitution over here, this simplifies down into du over u. And that is equally as simple to integrate. But now we can integrate each of these. So we're gonna have one half, and then the antiderivative of one is just x, and then we're gonna have minus the natural log of u because we have one over u over there, but notice u is equal to sine x plus cosine of x, so that's gonna be the natural log of sine of x plus cosine of x. Okay, so, but that is not our function f of x, that is just this thing which gets put inside the exponential. So what I'll do from here is I'll erase this bottom bit of the board and then I will insert this into this part of the function. So I took that antiderivative and I put it inside the exponential, and now let's simplify it a little bit. So we can use exponent rules. Just recall by exp u, I really mean e to the u. It's just kind of a little simpler if I put a lot of stuff inside an exponential to write exp instead of trying to fit all of that in a superscript. So that means I can use the product and sum rules for exponentials pretty uh, easily. So here we have e c times e to the x over 2 and then times e to the minus one half natural log of sine of x plus cosine of x. Great. So I just split that difference into a product of exponentials. Now the next thing that I want to do is take this minus half here and put it to a minus half here, again using our logarithm rule. But now that's going to allow this exponential and this logarithm to cancel and we're left with c e to the x over 2, but then we have sine x plus cosine x to the negative half, but negative exponents send it to the denominator, and then the half turns it into a square root, so we have the square root of sine of x plus cosine of x in the denominator. And so let's reiterate what we've done here. Given the function g of x is cosine of x, if we let f of x be c times e to the x over 2 over the square root of sine plus cosine, then this rule is satisfied. In other words, the derivative of f times g is equal to the derivative of f times the derivative of g. So maybe play around with some other test functions g to see if you can find nice functions f that make this rule satisfied and post your findings in the comments.